Hello, uh, my name is Judges Hai, and today I'm, I'm going to give a preview on OSDI 2021 and ATC 2021 sessions, including security and privacy and blockchain and security. So as I've been teaching uh, system security in the university, uh, this is a highly interesting topic to me. And my goal today is to uh, cover as much background knowledge as possible so that uh, you can enjoy this technical talk uh, more. So at first, I'm going to start with uh, define the security properties such as integrity, confidentiality, and privacy. And then I'm going to talk about the centralized versus decentralized models, including blockchains, and also uh, talk about security defensive strategy and classifications. Finally, uh, we're going to jump into a few paper specific uh, backgrounds such as encryption, secure computations, fully homomorphic encryption, MPC, and uh, TEE, confidential computings, and Intel SGXs. Uh, and finally, memory access pattern, penetration testing, and bug detections. So, first of all, how do we define security? So, uh, we can define security based on a few security properties. You can observe these security properties in the systems or functions which take some input data, process it, and generate some output data. A few properties that people constantly talk about uh, are, first of all, integrities, which is defined as protection of the data or system state from illegal modifications. Another one people constantly talk about is confidentialities, which is defined as protection of data or system state from illegal observations. And beside these two, there are also other security properties such as uh, availabilities, but we're not going to talk about them in this talk. Another thing we need to clarify is the distinction between confidentialities and privacy. In a lot of sense, they are very similar, but Confidentiality is focused on the protection of the data or the system state, uh, while privacy is focusing on the protection of users' identities or personal information from illegal observations of both data and metadata. The reason that metadata matters here is because even if Alice is communicating with Bob through a confidential channels, you thought this channel should be protect their privacy. However, there's a chance that the channel itself will leak a lot of metadata, including who is sending the messages, how big is the messages, and also the timing of the message being sent. Therefore, although privacy is also protecting data, it does pose a unique set of challenges from the protection of confidentiality. To identify how these security properties could be protected in your system, you need to first model your threats. Here is where we talk about the threat models. So here are a few common threat models people will consider. The first model is a single party models where all the entities are in the same camp. So they were likely to follow protocols and also will not leak data. So this is considered a centralized trust models. The second model is a multi-party models where everybody is on their own, they're potentially malicious, and they may not follow protocols and could leak data. In these cases, we talk, call it a decentralized trust model. In the last cases, it's kind of in the middle, so you can have multiple party models where the trust is indeed decentralized, however, all the entities in the parties are actually semi-honest. It means they will still follow protocol honestly, but there's potential chances they can leak data, which therefore it, this is also called honest but curious model. Let's use blockchain as an example to explain how a decentralized model could actually work. So in the blockchain, you can have a number of users. Each user has a number of Bitcoin and also uh, has, could issue some number of transactions to be taken by the system. So in order to take these transactions and put them in order, we need to have these miner, for example, the miner Dave here, to take this transaction and put them into a block. And also, because all the transactions need to uh, form into global orders, you need to also chain these blocks together with other blocks in the systems. 
uh, in order to make make sure this happens, we include the hash values of the previous block in the current blocks and, and then hash the whole block together. Therefore, it's, there's no way to temper these orders uh, between blocks as well as the orders of transaction within a specific blocks. However, this is simply not enough because blockchain is a decentralized trust model. You can have a different miner, such as the miner Mallory here, who is trying to maliciously replace the existing blockchain with a new blocks. In this, inside this new block, uh, Mallory could deliberately exclude the transaction of Bob's. It will be similar as, as Bob's transaction has never happened before, and similar as the miner Dave's blockchains also have never happened before. So to prevent these cases, we need to have some defense mechanisms. So inside blockchain, we have this thing called the proof of work. So proof of work is a concept that before adding a blocks, we ask every miner to solve a computationally hard puzzles. So because solving this puzzle is take time, actually take time. So Mallory has to compete with all the other miners, such as uh, miner Dave, miner Aaron's, miner Frank and assuming the majority of the miners are all good, they are all incentivized to follow the protocol, most of the time, Mallory will not win the competitions, therefore, Mallory cannot grow this, uh, this uh, blockchain very long by excluding Bob's transaction. When thinking about defense strategy, I would typically put them into a diagram like this. So in a sense, you can think about defense strategy based on whether they are based on proof of property of mathematics, or they could be based on structural properties of system. On the other hand, you can also consider them either definitive, which means they are blocking the attackers decisively, or they could be optimistic, it means they are simply raising the bar for attackers or lowering the bar for defenses. So you can try to categorize all the defense strategy here. For example, you can consider randomization as a technique that's mathematical, but optimistic. On the other hand, most of the access control mechanism could be systematics because they are based on the structural designs of the system, but also defensive. Next, let's look at two critical strategies here. One is encryptions or secure uh, computation. This is considered uh, mathematical, also definitive, and also TEEs or memory protections. This is systematics, but also definitive. Encryption is one of the most critical defense technique in security. So there are two basic forms of encryptions. One is called symmetric encryptions or secret key encryptions. In this case, you have a single key called secret key, and using this secret key, you can encrypt a uh, plain text files into a cipher text. Later, in order to decrypt it back, you can use the same secret key to reverse the cipher text back to the plain text. Another form of encryptions is called asymmetric encryptions or public key encryptions. In these cases, you have a key pair. You have a public key and a private key. Uh, for example, you can use the public key or, or private key to sign um, a secret files. In these cases, you would generate a signatures as the cipher tags. And later, using the other key, for example, the public keys, you can reverse it back and use it to verify the signature. Using this encryption scheme, you can have some truly amazing use cases. For example, you can use it for secure computations. One really good example is uh, fully homomorphic encryptions. So in these cases, you have a user such as Alice, which is, has on some security data. And you want these data to be processed on a remote untrusted third-party machines. And when it returns, it will return any uh, processing results. It could be, either could be a plus operations or a dot operations. Because Alice needs to protect its data, uh, Alice will put, uh, encrypt this data from the beginnings. But even without decrypting those data, on the remote machines, we can either use dots or plus operations on the cipher tags, which was equivalent as using the operations on the plain text as well. 
So later, when you simply send the results back to the analyst, you can simply decrypt it and we'll get the result of m plus n or m dot n. So this is a unique property that's being used, very useful for fully homomorphic encryptions. Another example of secure computation is garbled circuits, which is typically used for multi-parties computations. In this case, as you can imagine, there are two parties, Yvonne and Guinea, and each of them has some kind of secrets, and because they don't trust each other, they cannot tell each other their secrets. However, they do have to compute some kind of function collaboratively. Imagine here, the function is uh, simply an uh, end gate. So in order to do these computations, Yvonne has to generate um, four different circuits. Within these circuits, you have uh, you use encryptions with the key being the hash values of two different labels generated with different value of E and G. And using this key to encrypt the final result, later um, this, uh, these four circuits will be sent to Guinea after shuffling to prevent Guinea from figuring out which ones is which. And then later, Guinea simply have to figure out the hash values of the label of the corresponding values of E and G. And using this hash value as a key, they can decrypt one of these uh, circuits to get the final results. During this process, E, Yvonne, and Guinea will not reveal the data to each other. One thing about these secure computation mechanism is that they may be too expensive in terms of the computation cost and the communication cost. So in these cases, you know, there's actually another alternative, which is using TEE, the trust execution environment, with memory protections. So one of these examples of TEE with memory protection is Intel Software Guard extensions or SGXs. So SGXs is a feature existing on a lot of Intel off-the-shelf CPUs. This provides a chance for a remote trusted entity to run a trusted applications with sensitive data on an untrusted operating system. So in these cases, the Intel CPU actually create an environment called Enclave. So this Enclave is a completely isolated environment. Within this Enclave mode, the trusted application could process the sensitive data. But, and also this unclean mode could provide a proof to the remote trusted entity using the uh, encryption mechanisms. Then if uh, the Intel CPU was simply done with the unclean mode, they can switch back to untrusted operating system and enter into the normal mode. In these cases, all the data inside the enclave will be encrypted inside the DRAM. So this is the part with memory protections using encryptions. Both secure computations and TEE with memory protection could potentially have the issues of memory access patterns. In these cases, you, you have uh, data-dependent memory access that could leak the content of memory through the location that the memory has been read or written. One classic example is RSA's ALGA modes algorithm. For example, based on uh, different bits within the key, uh, different functions will be called, for example, when the uh, when the bit was zero, only square and reduce will be called. And when the bit was one, there were four functions, square, reduce, multiply, and reduce will be called. In these cases, based on by observing these patterns, you can either have a differential timing attack by observing different latencies occurs in the system, or you can have contentions attack in system state like caches or TOB. In order to assess the risk in a system or program, you have to go through penetration testing and bug detections. There are typically two ways of doing this. One way is, is static methods, including program analysis, model checking, and formal verifications. Using these techniques, you can extract system attributes such as control flow graph, data flow graph, or program invariance. Another method is dynamic methods, including system tracing and runtime detections. Here you can extract uh, exceptions and runtime violations. Uh, although you can combine these techniques together, they, both of them have their weaknesses. Uh, for static methods, it could be time consuming and it will have to be done conservatively because it has error. You also have a pretty deep learning curve because they are quite complex. 
But in dynamic methods, typically, it's quite hard to guarantee its coverage of a single run or multiple run. So you will have to use techniques like fuzzings or symbolic executions. Also, there's a runtime overhead you have to overcome. So that's all for the preview today. Here are the lines up for the papers that you're probably looking forward to. So for the domain of secure computation and cryptographic enforcement, there are the mage paper and death paper focus on uh, virtual memory for secure computations and cryptographic enforcement for end-to-end -end data privacy. For metadata privacy, there are ADRATS, which is a metadata private voice communication system over fully untrusted infrastructure. Um, there is also decentralization and blockchain efficiency and testing works, including bringing decentralized search to decentralized services and off the chain execution environment for scalable testing and profiling for smart contracts and ring blocks, which is a faster transaction processing in public blockchains. And there's also TEN confidential computing work, including Avocado, which is a secure in memory distributed storage system. And also, another work is accelerating encrypted du duplications via SGXs. And finally, for bug detection and penetration testing, there's finding consensus bugs in Ethereum via multi transaction differential fuzzing and Icarus, which is uh, a model a system to attacking low earth orbit satellite networks so hopefully you can find uh the works that you're interested in listen to them and hopefully you enjoy them thank you